Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to Questions on British Muslim TV with me, Mohammed Shafiq. We're broadcasting Sky Channel 752 and across social media at British Muslim TV, wherever you are joining us. A very warm welcome. Now, we want to hear your thoughts and experiences on the stories we're featuring today. Call us now on 01924231083 or on the WhatsApp number, which is on your screen now. Let's give you the latest on the UK lockdown and the pandemic. Now, the government announced, the government has announced that care home residents will now be able to leave their homes for low risk trips without having to self-isolate for 14 days afterwards. The rules have been relaxed in England from Tuesday, uh, yesterday actually, allowing for walks or garden visits without self-isolation. The government has said that a fall in COVID positive cases now means it is much safer for care home residents to go outside. A government scientific advisor, Professor Sir Paul Walpott, has urged people to be patient for a short period ahead of the next planned relaxation of COVID rules in England. He said there was some very good news in the progress of the pandemic, but many people were still not vac vaccinated. Put my teeth back in there. May the 17th will be the next date which will mark the next stage in relaxation uh, restrictions in England and will include allowing pubs, cafes and restaurants to now serve customers indoors. Remember, at the moment, they can only serve them outside. International travel is also expected to resume with a traffic light system grading destinations on their risk levels. We expect an announcement on this uh, later this week, I think on Friday, from the Transport Secretary Grant Shapps. Now, the latest government figures released suggest that 65% of adults in the UK have had their first dose of a vaccine and 27.6% have had both doses. But 35% have not yet received their first do dose, so there is still a bit more work to do. People can meet in groups of up to 30 outdoors. Six people or two households can meet indoors. Domestic overnight stays allowed with people not in your household or bubble. These are some of the rules that uh, will be relaxed. Pubs and restaurants and other hospitality venues can see customers indoors. Up to 30 people can attend weddings or other life events like Christine's. Outdoor entertainment such as... Um, outdoor theatres and cinemas can open subject to restrictions. Indoor entertainment, including museums, theatres, cinemas and children's play areas can open. Performance and large events can restart, but with limits on audience numbers. Hotels, hostels and bed and breakfasts that have been closed can now reopen uh, on May the 17th. And international leisure travel may resume. And the last bit is adult indoor group sports and exercise classes can restart. That's what's proposed from May the 17th. And we expect there's going to be some significant changes in regards to funerals as well. The restrictions on funerals uh, is expected to be lifted uh, a, a month early because of, of uh, the safety that's coming in through in terms of the data. So that is something to look forward to. Now, in other news, the United States military has formally began withdrawing troops from Afghanistan, beginning the end of a war that has cost trillions of dollars with thousands killed. The Taliban and Afghan government are still in talks to end the violence in Doha and in Turkey. The withdrawal will run until September, when only a small force will remain to protect diplomatic staff and buildings. The question we can all ask ourselves, is Afghanistan any safer now than it was 20 years ago? I think we should know the answer to that. Shortly we head to London to talk to the founder of the Muslim census, Sadiq Dorasat, about how we can measure what British Muslims are thinking and saying. Sadiq joins us live shortly. Then we head to Birmingham to talk to Dr. Maryam Mahmood about religious and spiritual abuse. And we then finish off heading to Spain to talk to Marta Maryam Rosa about another virtual Ramadan and Nur and Zafir, the online lifestyle Muslim magazine. So we want to hear from you tonight. You can call us on 01924-231-083 or you can message us on British Muslim TV across social media. Send us a WhatsApp message. The number is on your screen. The questions we're considering today. How important is it for Muslim centres to be supported by British Muslims? How can we expose spiritual abuse discarded as religious duty? And how is Ramadan different for you this year? That number again is 01924-231-083 or messages on WhatsApp, which a number is on your screen, as I often keep telling you. Let's start with our first topic. British Muslims are often ignored by mainstream media organisations or even referred in a negative way. My next guest wants the Muslim voice to be heard and respected. He set up the Muslim Census. Muslim Census is an independent organisation dedicated to using data to identify and highlight individual issues faced by the British Muslim community. Sadiq Dorasat holds a BSc in Mathematics at Queen's Mary University 
in London and has two years of experience of working within wealth and digital at the Global Bank, specialising in data and research. Sadiq identified the lack of data within the Muslim community and created a vision for Muslim census. Pleased to say Sadiq is joining us live from London. Sadiq, a very warm welcome. Welcome, and it's great having you on British Muslim TV. Assalamu alaikum, Muhammad. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for, for giving us the platform to share our work. Uh, well, I'm really excited because I know we covered um, the Muslim census a few weeks ago, so it's great to get the uh, founder of it here on the programme. Tell us, how is Ramadan in a pandemic for you this year? Alhamdulillah, it's it's good. Um, the weather isn't great, so I don't have Even to be jealous about... <laughs> yeah, it's terrible weather here. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's it's good because... Alhamdulillah, the masajid have been open okay. compared to last year. So uh, I have experienced that community feeling um, that I haven't experienced previous year. So Alhamdulillah, it's, it's been going well for me. How about you, Mohammed? Alhamdulillah, it's been beautiful. I uh, spent most of my time in this studio, but that's a different story. <laughs> um, but the end is nearly in sight, as they say, Sadiq. Uh, tell us, uh, where did you grow up? And uh, tell us a bit about your growing up experiences. Yeah, yeah. So, um, born and raised in East London, Hackney specifically. Um, alhamdulillah, I uh, studied mathematics uh, f throughout school and, and A levels, and then alhamdulillah, I got a degree in mathematics, specialising in statistics, statistical modelling, um, and then following on from that, actually got a role, a graduate scheme within a global bank working in wealth and asset management. Again mostly focusing on research and, and portfolio work. Um, and then now, alhamdulillah, phased into digital, which is more around user research. And across all of these fields um, and experiences that I had, I understood the importance of data. Whenever a decision was made or um, a strategy was decided, it was always focused around data. And then when I compared that to this sort of charity and volunteer work that I did for, for Muslim organizations, I didn't see the same focus. Um, and that was one of the kind of triggering um, facets to why I started Muslim Census, of which there are many, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. And you currently work in a global bank. How do you balance that responsibility out with your community activities? Um, yeah, so it's it's nine to five, and then as soon as I close one laptop, I open the other. <laughs> um, <laughs> but alhamdulillah, I, I really, really enjoy it. Um, and I would say the balance isn't, you know, amazing, but it's, it's something that I enjoy. So I don't really see it as doing something rather than the other. Yeah. Um, so alhamdulillah. Yeah. And, and in a sense, we often hear what the British Muslim community is thinking and talking. And we often hear it on my program here on British Muslim TV, talking to the sort of pioneers and pillars in the community. But we don't often hear collectively what people really think. Um, is that one of the main reasons why you set up the Muslim census? Absolutely. So uh, I, I've been um, privy to sitting in board meetings within charities, for example. And when they're deciding a strategy, not all, but for the ones that I've had exposure to, it would be up to someone on that board or that table to have a really good idea and they would run with it. Whereas where's the true insight from the people that we're actually actually trying to assist, the Muslim community, everyday people like myself and you, uh, how are we gathering their insights? What do they think? Um, and that's what Muslim Census is here trying to do, trying to bring the Muslim community insight into the discussions of organizations and charities to truly reflect what people are, what people want and need, mm. inshallah. Uh, and how do you hope to achieve the work that you do? Yeah, so uh, how we do it currently, um, of course, pandem pandemic enforced is majority online. Uh, so we run online surveys and conduct interviews. Um, and for, for across all of our surveys, we have a minimum of 1,000 participants that complete our surveys, share their opinions. Some are qualitative questions, which means yes, no, uh, but some are, sorry, quantitative, yes, no, yeah. and some are qualitative, which ask a sort of question of what do you think? And we allow people to express themselves within our surveys. And then we, of course, conduct the analysis to derive the key findings. Yeah, we're coming close to our first break, but just tell us, um, how do you fund the organisation? Where's the funding coming from? 
Yeah, so what we do is um, initially it was completely bootstrapped, which means it was funded by myself and the co-founder. Uh, but now we run commission studies. Um, so, for example, we did a study for Ramadan at work, uh, Muslims' experiences uh, within the professional sector, and we were sponsored or we get commissioned to actually run these studies. And that's how we facilitate and fund our community work. And what's the general reaction been from British Muslims to this important initiative? So initially, and, and quite rightly, when a new organisation pops up, there is uh, suspicions around the motives, who's behind it, and, and absolutely, that, that should be the case. Uh, but once we break down the barriers and show how transparent we are, what we are here to do, what we are here to achieve, alhamdulillah, the response has been really, really strong. Um, we've, we've been featured in many different publications, The Guardian, uh, Al Jazeera, um, Huffington Post, as well as Muslim organizations such as Five Pillars, British Muslim TV now, Islam Channel, alhamdulillah, you know, so the reaction has been positive amongst the community so far. Yeah, and, and a real sense that people understand the importance of this work because, you know, uh, finding what the pulse of the Muslim community is, what the conversation is in the dinner, uh, on the dinner table is really important. Absolutely. And, and when we look at, for example, there are statistics out there for UK averages, but what we've found and what, several other reports find is that for certain demographics, be that ethnicities or faith, the picture is completely different. So we are here to give a truer representative of the Muslim community, inshallah. Yeah, well, that's what we're going to do. We're going to, I know, Sadiq, you're going to stay with us. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll carry on the important conversation uh, with Sadiq Dorasat, who is the founder um, of the Muslim Census. Um, which is really important. But the other story which is breaking in the last couple of hours that I thought I'd share with you, if I can get it on my... Um, to, here we are. So this is the... Um, if you remember, Donald Trump was banned from Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. Well, today, the uh, Facebook Oversight Board, which is set up to look at decisions Facebook makes, um, have, uh, have upheld Donald Trump's ban, but asked for Twitter, Facebook to review the ban uh, within six months and not make it a permanent ban and don't treat him any differently. So that's coming in from Facebook. Uh, we'll take a break. When we come back, we'll carry on the conversation with Sadiq. Join us on the other side of this. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back to Questions with me, Mohammed Shafiq, exclusively here on British Muslim TV. We are now taking your call, so we are live uh, on 019242310833. You can get in touch with us on our social media handles at British Muslim TV. Let me just give you that story, which is broken the last hour. Donald Trump's uh, ban on Facebook has been upheld, but um, the oversight board, which is set up of former diplomats and prime ministers, have asked Facebook to look at that decision and not treat. Donald Trump uh, account any different to um, the accounts of ordinary users. And it also talks about the sense that where did this come from? Uh, if you remember the insurrection where the protesters, Donald Trump supporters, stormed the US Capitol Congress building uh, on January the 6th and um, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram uh, took a decision and YouTube took a decision to suspend or permanently expel Donald Trump from that platform. But that's the story coming in from Facebook. But Sadiq uh, Dorasat is still with us. And uh, we were talking before the break about the British Muslim census, so we'll uh, talk about that in a bit. A second, but so I think we've got a caller. Let's uh, uh, let's see who's on the line. Salam alaikum. You're live on British Muslim TV. Wa alaikum salam, my brothers. Uh, my name is Amir from Berry, Manchester. Hi, Amir. You okay? Yeah, not bad. Just uh, listening to Sadiq and yourself, and you just inspired me to call, really. Oh, excellent. Uh, more like him, he inspired you, not me. Uh, but that's a different story. <laughs> uh, tell us, how's your? Uh, tell us, what's your question or your comment, sir? Yeah, uh, so basically, I, um, I looked at the Muslim census and um, I thought to myself, um, there was a census done um, in the British newspapers and um, it was regarding the ethnic minority being subjected um, to, um, shall I say, a higher percentage to, uh, to um, is, shall I say, the white and the... And, yeah. and, uh, this is know. a 3.5 times higher uh, to get yeah. COVID-19, which is actually in That's the report. Right. It's one of my next questions. Yes. Are you reading yeah. my mind? Because it's the next question. <laughs> well, that's, what hit me. that's what hit me. And I thought to myself, you know, in, in, within the community itself, okay, there's Muslims 
that are on the front line. The last time I heard a Muslim talk about this in their professional field was saying, uh, even though they are more qualified and they are higher in uh, in their education, um, they actually put they are put forward. And there was a race report uh, saying that um, the ethnic minority. I'm not going to say I've been subjected to this, which I have been, but you're put on the front line, whereas the more privileged society or the middle class are hiding behind the veil. Um, and I just and, I, and as a British Muslim, I was grown up in a in a racist area, but I was proud to be, uh, um, you know, um, uh, my neighbour, she called me, whatever she called me, but uh, she was my mother as well. We shared food in Ramadan. We left the doors open. We was in that sort of Benny Hill sort of society where the British Muslims were all part of the uh, uh, sort of, um, you know, the culture, the mm. church, and it was all part of a community. Now mm. it's more there, your Bengalis are there, your, your, you know, your, your Pakistanis, Meeseburis, and there's a bit, bit of Bataans and... They've got their own segregated moss. And I think the British community have failed um, and, and we impacted. Looking at you two educated people, um, but our parents were educated and they used to call them Chitte on Par. But yet they're the ones that created the moss, the community and the, did. And the, and the structure within society. They were, they were the pioneers. So. They were the pioneers yeah. who built everything and most of them came from villages and didn't really speak English. Exactly. Um, thank you so like much. Uh, me and you, you know, uh, we, we're here, we're good English. We, we can... We, we can Build a report. We can even, you know, uh, sell our religion to scientists and and and, and look good. You know, there was a, um, a a position where I thought this census might be able to identify and and, and not sort of like a red tape because I know the Asian community like to cover uh, a lot of their issues, but I think that this census will be able to open up um, within the different communities. Um, and, and I think. Uh, uh, when you look at ethnic minorities, you've got the Bangladeshis and you've got the okay. uh, Patans that are doing certain jobs and taxi drivers that are doing certain yeah. jobs that will put themselves at risk only because, not that they're poor, they've got houses, they've got uh, educated children, you know, they, yeah. they, 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 they've got um, land back home, but it's just because of the way their mindset is yeah. or the way they feel they are. So I don't know but how to listen to Yeah, there's sort of multiple, um, multiple issues there that you've raised there, Amir. But thank you for your call uh, there, Amir, from Berry. Um, yeah, and there's lots of people who live... Who, um, have to go and work because they can't survive without work. And uh, during this pandemic, we saw the taxi drivers, the takeaway workers who've been working pretty long hours, so we salute them all. Now, let, let, so I think let's move on to that report. The report you did recently was, um, uh, uh, in terms of the census, was that Muslims had tentative... Sorry, let me put my teeth back in. Muslims have yeah. tested positive for COVID-19 at a rate 3.5 times higher than the national average. Were you shocked by this? So, shocked is it, it's difficult to explain. I, I think action should be done about this, absolutely. But shocked, no. Uh, because we've run previous reports um, around the financial impact of COVID. And what we found was that Muslims were in key worker roles, aka frontline roles, uh, at a rate 13. And for Muslim women, 17% higher than the UK average. So in essence, Muslims are in the front line more susceptible to contracting the virus. And then we, uh, an another question from our lockdown report, um, understanding the average UK household size. So for the total UK average is around 2.4. However, for Muslims, it is almost double that. So in essence, you, you're, you're on the front line, more susceptible to the virus, and then you're bringing it home to more people um, that isn't factored in when you're looking at UK averages and the, the typical non-ethnic minority person who doesn't have the same experience. So, no, I wasn't surprised by that. Um, it's a worrying statistic. It, it supports um, the, the research done by the government following on from, from, from the high death, rate, high death toll for uh, ethnic minorities. Um, and absolutely, uh, this needs to be looked at, especially with the, the vaccine uptake as well. Yeah, well, we're just going to come on to that. Early on, we saw BME uh, take up of the vaccine quite low before Christmas uh, and in January uh, compared to their white counterparts. But actually, the latest figures uh, from Public Health England suggest that for Pakistanis, for example, it's gone up now to 92 percent from a low point of 54 percent. 
Um, that's a massive achievement and down to lots of people in communities making a, an impact and, and doing their fair share of heavy lifting. Absolutely. I think um, what was very, very interesting was in December, January, there was a heavy narrative, early parts of February, around BAME hesitancy, and, and rightly so. But what we saw was the community I'm talking uh, organizations such as BIMA, MCB, massages across the country. They took that as a, a action to, to support themselves within the community. And as you can see now, uptake within these ethnic minority groups are actually higher than the white average now. Um, so that is absolutely a success story uh, following on from, from, from this, this pandemic. Um, and so ha have you shared your report, that particular one about COVID and, and the BME communities with the government and the NHS? And what, is the, what has their response been? Yes, we have. Um, and alhamdulillah, we've been involved in discussions um, and, and working groups. And actually, we are now working with the NHS on our latest survey. And I will have to ha have to promote this now. Um, sure. If you visit our website. Uh, we are currently running a survey around vaccine uptake and vaccine strategy for the future phases. So focusing primarily on the 16 to 35 age demographic and understanding what are their concerns. Um, so if you do fit that category, please visit our website and complete that survey because this is being directly fed to the NHS, inshallah. Yeah, and, and so pick up that point with Amir uh, talking about what can we as British Muslims do differently personally and learn the lesson from what we've acted in this pandemic? So I think this pandemic has forced us to advance um, and, and it is a positive. Of course, um, lives have been lost and and we have to factor that in. But the situation where we are now, we are taking healthcare more seriously. We are taking other other facets of our 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 faith more seriously. Even mental health, uh, a study in our uh, from our latest report, factors in mental health. Um, and what I encourage is those conversations to be continued, and those conversations with your local GP, your local MP, your counsellor, to ensure that Muslims are factored in just as how they have been factored in for the vaccine, for all future uh, academic, healthcare, both mental and physical, we should be factored into these discussions to understand the nuances of our community. Let our front, let our front leaders, our leaders of our community be privy to those conversations because they're the ones that are best put to understand and facilitate the entire Muslim population of the UK, which is over 3 million. So I, I encourage Muslims to just keep having those conversations. Yeah, keep having those conversations. And, and, and you know, what Amir was talking about, there is deprivation, there's multi-occupancy in households, there's low paid jobs, uh, rather than just COVID uh, having a negative impact in communities. Yeah, I, I mean, if we, if we look at it even pre-pandemic, almost half of the Muslim population lived in the 10% most deprived areas in England. And uh, another study from 2013 that 44% of Muslims earn below the living wage in the UK. So add in the pandemic onto that, where from, from our report, Muslims have suffered six times greater job loss. Uh, they've fallen into pan, uh, poverty at one, uh, one in five Muslims have fallen into poverty, which is 10 times greater the UK rate. But it, it's, it's, it's a tragic scenario. Um, and, and it's up to Muslim organizations as well as non-Muslim organizations and the government to facilitate and support our community with, with upskilling work, um, looking at post for, for graduates, because that's the biggest concern on, on graduate jobs and, and the graduate job market, facilitating and supporting yeah. the Muslim, Muslim community, inshallah. Uh, my final question, uh, Sadiq, you'll be pleased to hear. Uh, what can we look forward to in terms of the Muslim census? What, what other activities are you going to be focusing on going forward? So we've seen already in our short time of existence the demand for insight from ordinary Muslims. And we will continue to do exactly that and publish insightful, valuable reports. What we want to look at is uh, mosque accessibility, addiction, marriage, all of these facets and issues that arise 
within the Muslim community, how can we provide insights and data so that the relevant and specialist organizations can, can tackle those and so that we can generate the conversations um, so that people are aware of the issues that we face. So, so that's that's what, what is in store. And obviously you guys can support by just visiting our, our website, completing our surveys, and of course, following us on our socials, inshallah. Yeah, well, I promise to retweet you, uh, Sadiq. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. It's been important to hear about your work and we look forward to welcoming you back. Thank you for having me. Asalaamu As Alaikum. Uh, Asalaamu We're going to break for Azan -e, uh, Asar in London and surrounding areas, wherever you are in the rest of the UK, please follow your local timetable. We'll take a break, we'll come back and we'll move on to our next topic. Join us on the other side of this. Asalaamu Alaikum. Assalamu alaikum, welcome back to Questions with me, Mohamed Shafiq, exclusively here on British Muslim TV. We're taking your calls on 019242310830. You can get in touch with us on our social media handles at British Muslim TV. Now, let's move on to our next topic. Faith is very important and the centre of our lives. Those leading in prayers, teaching our children, or interacting with wider society have a responsibility to have the highest standards and morality. Too often we have often I've heard cases of those in leadership positions abusing their positions to target vulnerable people for sexual or financial reasons. There are many examples of that, not just within the Muslim community, but also within wider society. So what can we do to tackle the issue of spiritual abuse? What is it? And how can we help break the taboo uh, on this conversation, which often happens in the Muslim community? And these people who live, really live in responsible uh, positions are the people that should be shunned, not the victims. Dr. Maryam Mahmood is breaking the taboo to start a conversation on, on spiritual abuse. And um, Maryam is joining us uh, from the Midlands. Um, she joined the University of Birmingham in July 2019. Her research is focused in the past uh, on response to religious and racial stigma stigmatization and prejudice against Muslims in contemporary England and Jews in Weimar in Germany. Uh, amongst many other things, including the spiritual abuse that she's focusing on at the moment. I'm pleased to say Dr. Maryam uh, Mahmood is joining us live from the Midlands. Uh, Maryam, Salaam Alaikum and a very warm welcome to the program. Wa Alaikum Asalaam and thank you so much for inviting me here as a guest today. It's great to have you on. I'm really excited for our conversation. Uh, just tell us, how is Ramadan during this pandemic treating you and your family? Well, Alhamdulillah, it's as blessed as it can be, despite it being the second Ramadan during this pandemic. I hope the same for you and uh, your viewers too. Yeah, that's great. Now, just tell us quite simply, in simple language, what is spiritual abuse? So, quite simply, spiritual abuse occurs when people in positions of relative power distort or deliberately misinterpret religious teachings or practices in order to coerce, control or manipulate vulnerable people, vulnerable believers into acting, behaving or thinking in ways that might be harmful to them. Yeah. And what underpins this spiritual abuse? Mm -hmm. So what underpins it is quite simply this desire to dominate to overpower, to stay in control. Uh, and much like any other form of abuse, you can see that happening. However, what's really unique about spiritual abuse is that it entails this weaponization of what's most dear to those victims. It's their faith. Yeah. Um, and and this, can, this, this doesn't just affect women and children, mm -hmm. but also can affect men as well. Absolutely, 100%. I receive cases from survivors who are uh, young men. And as I said earlier, the key is that they're placed in a vulnerable position which compromises their well being, uh, their safety. They are preyed upon and exploited as a result. So the majority of faith based spaces happen to be patriarchal in nature. As such, this renders women and young children uh, more uh, at the behest of, of these abusers. However, young men are also uh, vulnerable. Anyone can be affected. Yeah, and, and in a sense that mental health plays a role, and there's a sense that those, those men who are abused, uh, young men who are abused, often feel nowhere to turn to for help and support. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. And there's this often, you know, this toxic masculinity that is prevalent across the board. It's not specific to any faith community or any community per se. It's just, unfortunately, this is the reality that we live with. And so many survivors who happen to be men fear speaking out. And in your views, who are the abusers? So as I said, anyone uh, in a position of relative power to the mm. victim. So this usually in the context of uh, faith-based spaces means male figureheads because they happen to have the most power relative to uh, people in these so communities. So you're talking about spaces. imams here, peers, yeah. scholars, so say, teachers? Yeah, honestly, it could go from anywhere in the home. So this could even be fathers, uncles, grandfathers, it's not necessarily just in the position of, you know, mosque-based or faith-based yeah. spaces in the sense of places of worship, but um, school teachers, it can be anyone who is in a position of power. And it depends on the relative level in comparison to the victim. So, you know, um, if somebody has a level of authority, it doesn't mean that they, it's not really about what they look like, it's about what they do with that power. Yeah, because we know a number of cases that we've had in recent years in which a minority of imams, so-called peers, spiritual leaders, who mm. carry out this abuse sometimes will claim it's consensual. Yeah. Um, and that somehow then normalises that behaviour, doesn't it? Absolutely. Um, so spiritual abuse perpetrated by faith leaders or, as you mentioned, spiritual leaders like peers or even scholars we've seen in, in our lifetimes too many to count, unfortunately. And quite often the reaction is one of complete denial initially. Yeah. However, once they do feel that they, they need to own up and they have to admit, given the pressure mounted upon them by survivors as well as campaigners, they, uh, they claim this, that the, the victim has consented. And what they're doing in uh, saying this is three things. They are not only perpetuating victim blaming mm. uh, and absolving themselves of responsibility, they're hiding behind secular legal frameworks, which many of them would usually ridicule and mock as being haram. Yeah. Um, and now suddenly it's okay because it's providing that veneer of, uh, uh, this to, for them to escape through loopholes in the law. And finally, they shroud their sins in a number of supposed good deeds that they have committed in the past to leverage their standing in the community and often we'll hear calls uh, from within community spaces unfortunately that um, are on, along the lines of you know we should cover the sins of our mm. siblings in faith and of course we should but this shouldn't compromise the safety and security of individuals who are victims and, and it doesn't apply to sins that entail directly oppressing or harming other people so we need to distinguish when we say these things. Yeah. That's the key point, isn't it, uh, Dr. Miriam? Uh, if you're uh, harming another human being, then Islam compels you to take a stance and stand up against injustice. We seem to forget what our faith says about these sort of uh, crimes. Absolutely, 100% that, uh, you know, they exploit, abusers exploit uh, religious teachings, uh, in, in, you know, initially to enact the abuse, but also doubly so because mm. they try to cover their tracks using faith. So as such, as you said earlier, they normalize and oftentimes become, we become desensitized uh, from these things, uh, from spiritual abuse. It, you know, almost when I, when I receive cases uh, of uh, survivors, uh, often people in the community, when I do outreach work, I'm told this was an open secret. Yeah. And now I'm, I'm just really disappointed that it's come to this. Um, it's quite rather unfortunate, but, you know, there is still time and there's so much more we can do. Yeah. And then do you think the community tends to believe the imams or spiritual leaders because of their piety, because they're leaders, they're not supposed to be doing things what they are doing in terms of the abuse. And so therefore yeah. it, it goes against the norm of their understanding mm -hmm. of what an imam is or a peer is. So therefore yeah. they ignore it. Do you think that plays a part? Absolutely. It's a common initial reaction, unfortunately, you know, because we think this person is expressing overt piety. Uh, it's, you know, they're somehow closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And um, while our faith stresses that we must respect and have adab and ihtaram with these people, uh, with anyone almost, as you said quite rightly, it also implores us to stand for justice, to stand for truth, for the haq. And, and to be against um, any forms of oppression, even if the perpetrators happen to be our own family members. Mm. 
And, and, and in a sense, our silence collectively as a community to these issues usually contributes to the isolation uh, of victims um, and their families and their situation. Completely, completely. And hence why the campaign that I'm running at the moment is called Breaking Silence on mm. Spiritual Violence, because this is essentially the first step in countering and tackling these abusers. Yeah. And, and there is a case recently um, in the last few years in Birmingham, obviously we can't name the person, but a huge peer um, who used criminal gangs to stop victims speaking out against his sexual abuse what can we do as a community to make sure that that sort of person uh, is ostracized and, you know, kind of deflocked as they are in the Christian church to make sure that they never serve uh, in a public role ever again? There's so many ways in which we can tackle this, but, you know, each and every one of us has a role to play and it starts in the home. It's, it starts by speaking to young people, speaking to those who are most vulnerable about these issues. And once be, we become vocal about it, I can guarantee you there will be so many cases that we were quite unaware of. And that's, that's the sad part, that this is brewing within our own community. And the same way we teach young people uh, about um, harms of bullying and racism and even misogyny, Similarly, we should teach them that it is not okay for someone to use or abuse you simply because they have shrouded their um, activities with the veneer of uh, the faith. Yeah, and how important is that moral standing of our leaders, mm -hmm. our imams, our beads, our community leaders, our mosque leaders, to tackle this issue, to have a, a certain moral standard that we have a zero tolerance of this sort of behaviour? You know what, this is absolutely imperative that they have this moral standing because, of course, they are our role models in a way. And um, as someone, so as you mentioned earlier, I, I am an academic at the University of Birmingham where I train faith leaders to these. one of these challenges happens to be spiritual abuse. So obviously, you know, you can be a graduate of the best seminary in the world. You can be the most um, knowledgeable of your faith. But if you do not know how to implement this in your society, then I'm, you know, it's it's a, a huge, tremendous loss to not only your faith community but to the wider society as a whole. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, I don't know how long we've got, but let me ask one more question, and then we'll take a break. Uh, what does uh... What do victims need to do? What do we need to do as a community to provide that safe space so victims feel confident that when mm -hmm. they speak out, um, that they will be listened to and supported? Right. Um, so I'm glad you reframed the question. It's not the onus is not on the victim. Absolutely. Because they Often yeah. they suffer the most stigma and shame. Um, so what we should be doing, we don't want to extol this immense emotional labor upon them. So the person is dismissed because they're often rendered un-Islamic. You know, so what we should be doing is to help them deal with the trauma that they have. Um, and we shouldn't be silencing them. Quite often what happens is when campaigners stand up, uh, unfortunately we're told that um, our community already suffers from immense Islamophobia, which is really very true. I mean, I've spent um, almost a decade researching Islamophobia in Britain, so guaranteed okay. that is... Uh, do Dr. Murray, just stay there. We're reaching uh, the stage where we need to go for a quick break. Um, I know you're going to stay with us. Really fascinating conversation. I'd love to hear your thoughts as well. 01924231083. We'll take a break, come back, carry on the conversation. Dr. Murray Mahmood from the University of Birmingham. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back to Questions with me, Mohammed Shafiq. My special guest is Dr. Maryam Mahmood from the University of Birmingham, and she's still with us live uh, from the Midlands. Now, before the break, Dr. Maryam, uh, we were discussing spiritual abuse. This is not uniquely a Muslim problem, is it? Absolutely not. It occurs in all faiths. Uh, we speak from our own perspective, of course, because we are Muslims and um, this is something that affects us and we can o always give answers through the lens of our own experiences and what we know best. But, um, you know, oftentimes what happens is people use this almost as an excuse to not deal with spiritual abuse in Muslim communities. They say, well, you know, it happens everywhere. 
but um, that's 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 a really sorry excuse because we look, unfortunately, in places like you know the Catholic community with the Catholic Church scandals that were uh, immensely driven by spiritual abuse, and um, I don't think they're a bastion of uh, you know rights of of, of uh, vulnerable believers. So we shouldn't really be following that path. I hope not, anyway. Yeah, and and not the path in saying we shouldn't be uh, you know just because it's happening in the Christian faith or it's happening in the Jewish faith or the Hindu faith. Does it mean that we should kind of just turn a blind eye to it in the Muslim community? Absolutely. We need to be more understanding of survivors. We need to stop platforming abusers. You know, it, it sounds like easy things to do, but the immense silence when people speak out is really detrimental, not only to those individuals and their mental well-being, but to our communities as a whole. So we need imams, we need community leaders, we need people to pledge that we will eradicate this problem. And I'm very happy to discuss this with anyone who wishes to. And, and in terms of those conversations that you're having with the mosque and the imams, what, what sort of reaction are you getting? Um, so, alhamdulillah, you know, um, people are really, really receptive. So I think I should just kind of frame what I'm doing for your wider audiences. Please, yeah. Um, I'm one of the young religious leaders uh, on the United Nations Alliance of Civilizations Eden program, which empowers uh, young voices in interfaith. So this, for me, I was already campaigning uh, for spiritual abuse, ending spiritual abuse, but this campaign through UN-approved um, training has been immensely useful, not only to me, but to my community. So obviously I teach, as I said, I teach imams and all faith leaders about these problems. So my campaign isn't just uh, geared towards Muslim communities, of course, because I am a practicing Muslim, it will affect those most. But I'm here also for other communities. I work closely with Orthodox Jewish communities as well as Christian communities so that we can work together and learn from each other. Yeah, that's really important. Now, let's just uh, move on and talk a bit more about you. You do some really great YouTube videos, which I was watching yesterday. Tell us about that. Thank you so much uh, for your kind comments. Yes, I create uh, a lot of... Um, materials such as videos, infographics, spoken word content on my YouTube as well as my Instagram um, for the purpose of greater religious literacy and, um, you know, tackling taboo issues such as um, misogyny, um, spiritual violence, racism within religious communities. Because, you know, as an academic, I find often we're sitting in ivory towers. What use is our work if it's not being uh, applied in ordinary everyday settings? What use is it if there's no social impact so that is what drives me yeah and uh, when we look at the murder of Sarah Everard there was a national conversation about about not just her murder but how women feel yeah. um, how can we stop that violence uh, against women in this country well, that is a really, really good question. And I think, you know, it will take more than just one academic's voice. But I think you're right. It, violence towards women globally is endemic. And what we, we need to be doing is uh, offering solutions that are contextualized. So we, you know, address spiritual abuse or violence towards women that is driven by spiritual abuse, for instance, in faith settings uh, with the sensitivity um, and the due respect. So I'll give you an example, actually, of something that's happened recently as a result of campaigning. Um, so as some of us know that the uh, UK government is passing the domestic uh, abuse um, bill. And for the first time in history, we've had that um, any a, a case where, well, not a case, but um, this clause almost, excuse, excuse me, because my legal language probably yeah. isn't appropriate. But what it says is that in this bill, uh, any Jewish man who refuses his wife a divorce will automatically, that will be seen as a form of domestic abuse. Now, that is, you know, tremendous victory on the part of Orthodox Jewish campaigners who work against coercion and control in faith-based settings. Now, what we should be, you know, uh, doing is working to expand this so other people and other faith groups as well can also be protected by the law. Mm. Yeah, because isn't it just really about educating men? What can us men do to make women feel safer? Uh, I remember uh, about a year before the pandemic getting off a train uh, station, mm -hmm. it was dark, there was myself and another lady getting off 
Um, and I, I felt conscious that I, I, if I was walking behind her, that she might not feel comfortable. So um, I decided to speed up and walk in front of her rather than behind her, just to make her feel a bit more safer. Is that is that the sort of things that we need men? We need to have a conversation with ourselves, with our friends, our sons, our, our mm -hmm. nephews, and not say oh, this is because of how a woman dresses or is why what's a woman do that so late? You know, yeah. blaming the victim. Uh, you're Am I making sense? No, no, you, you very much are. I was going to say that, you know, we need more allies and you've given a perfect example of what you can do in your everyday. But I think I'm just going to add a caveat there. Sure. Um, and, I, and I'm grateful that you didn't say what should survivors do or how should survivors help us? Because often what happens is that um, we have a lot of male allies or so-called allies uh, within our communities who will say, you know, what should I do? Just let me know how I can help. And I just kind of sit back and think, you know, um, we deal with an immense amount of abuse in different forms in our communities, such as securitization of Muslim identity, right? And many of our brothers in the community are actually civil rights campaigners. And it, it makes me kind of laugh sometimes when they ask, what can we do? When they have provided solutions in different contexts. And it makes us wonder and question, is the only reason why you're asking us because uh, domestic abuse or spiritual abuse directed towards women is um, a lesser of, a, of a, an, an issue, then, um, you know, do you have this hierarchy of sensitivities placed in your own mind? Perhaps mm. we should address that. That's often what I, I speak quite nicely with my brothers in the faith about this, that, you know, this isn't for women to tell us, tell everyone what to do, but actually men should be working as allies to find those solutions. Yeah, and domestic violence affects all communities. Do we really need now a national campaign a national conversation across this whole country to stop this type of abuse and violence? Absolutely, we, we do. We need it globally, I'd say even, yeah. not just nationally, because you know we live in such a hyper-globalized world. We have so many layers to our identity. So we're not just Muslims. Many of your viewers will also be of different ethnic backgrounds. So that also influences how we live our lives, how we understand our faith, and how we interact with one another. So I think campaigns should be more uh, tapped into and in tune with the realities of people, the intersections of their identities. And that's why I think it's not just one campaign, but several different segments to that, that are driven from the bottom up. We need people within communities mm. leading the way, as opposed to being imposed by, um, you know, various different external forces. Yeah, and now I, I, I see you, Dr. Maria Mahmoud, as a real strong role model for my daughters, my four daughters. How important is education for women to look at you and what all that you've achieved and contributing? How important is education for our Muslim women? Thank you so much for such a kind comment. I really, really respect and appreciate that you think that of me. I think education is a, a key. It is one of the many keys to li uh, liberating and emancipating from um, many sort of uh, destitution and in poverty, uh, poverty as well, you know. So I think knowledge is um, definitely one of the ways in which we can um, empower women, but also it leads to financial stability as well, which that, you know, that guarantees in a way that they will probably be a bit more confident, inshallah, we hope. And also um, it teaches, well, when, I, when we talk about education, we should kind of say that this isn't just education in a secular sense, but also teaching them appropriately about their faith and that there are certain cultural trappings that they shouldn't be falling into and how sh they should be aware of their rights and their responsibilities. Yeah, and when you look at uh, women in history, which women inspire you? Gosh, the most inspiring women for me as a practicing Muslim woman are the Umat al -Mumineen. So obviously oh. the, the, the mothers of all believers, be starting from, you know, I, I couldn't place them accordingly, but obviously Bibi Khadija, Bibi Fatma, Bibi Aisha, Zainab, all of them, Bibi Asya, and of course, my own namesake, Bibi Maryam. So obviously all of these women are vital in their own way because each of them has a unique story. You know, often a lot of non-Muslims will ask, well, you don't have any women prophets in your faith and you're kind of thinking, thinking, well, you're putting a lot of, um, you know, uh, responsibility on, on the shoulders of a prophet. It takes a whole village. It takes an entire community. So why are yeah. we stressing on the fact that we need to have women prophets? Mm. We have these amazing figures who have had tribulations in their own life 
And they've overcome them with the uh, divine, well, often divine intervention, but also seeking the support of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and actively, you know, guarding and protecting the faith in their own way. You know, we look at Bibi Zainab's story um, in uh, after Karbala and how she kept the faith going. So I wow. think, you know, that's from my own faith. And then obviously we have, look around us today, we have other women who inspire us like black rights activists ranging from, you know, Bell Hooks, who's a scholar and Audre Lorde. So yeah. there are so many places that we can look for um, sort of inspiration. Yeah, what a powerful uh, answer there, Dr. Moni. My final question, uh, what message do you have for our viewers about spiritual abuse? I would like for people to take this issue seriously and if there are any victims um, who are watching, I want them to know that they shouldn't be suffering in silence. Please reach out. There are people there for support. There are resources in communities um, and I'm always here, you know, if you would like to reach out to me and my campaign and also my SAVE project, which stands for uh, Spiritual Abuse and Violence Eradication, specifically in Britain and, um, you know, especially within Muslim communities, feel free to reach out to me on my website and you can even get in touch via the producers here on British Muslim TV. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Maria, for joining us. Really powerful discussion there. Uh, and thank you so much for all that you're doing uh, in your important world. And I really do believe uh, I see you and many like you uh, in our community as role models for our young uh, girls growing up uh, in today's society. And thank you so, so much for giving me the opportunity yeah. to speak with you uh, on this pertinent issue. Have a great Eid. Thank you so much. Uh, that was Dr. Maria Mahmood from the Department of Theology and Religion at the University of Birmingham. She was uh, joining us there from the Midlands. Really powerful discussion there about spiritual and uh, I I imam mu abuse and the sense if anybody's been affected by that, if you need additional support, um, you can go to britishmuslim.tv uh, slash support uh, for further information how you can access support. So if you've been affected by what we were discussing there, or if you just want to reach out and get some additional support, uh, britishmuslim.tv slash support. Join us after a break where we talk about virtual Ramadan with Dr. Ma uh, Marta Maryam Rosa. Asalaamu As Alaikum, welcome back to Questions with me, Mohammed Shafiq, exclusively here on British Muslim TV. Let's move on to our next uh, topic. Just before we do that, remember the number is on your screen 01924. I should know this number 01924 231083. Now, as the COVID 19 pandemic lockdown continues to restrict large events, face to face events, the online and virtual sector is growing and growing massively. And some of us are asking why that this should now become the norm, even after restrictions are lifted later on this month here in the UK. Now, Nurin Zafir is a lifestyle magazine which organised the Change Makers event online in uh, March of this year via Zoom. Uh, Marta Mariam Rosa is the founder of the Nurin Zafir magazine and is providing sessions virtually throughout Ramadan. I'm pleased to say Marta is joining us live from Spain. Uh, Marta, very warm welcome to the show. Great to have you back. Thank you so much for having me. Tell us. Um, it's great to. Uh, yeah, it's great to have you. Um, how is this second Ramadan in the lockdown treating you and your family? Well, it's a bit of unusual one, like for many uh, many people I know. Um, it's not even because of the fact that we are, um, you know, like separated from all the loved ones or you know, family and friends, but. Um, I don't know. I think it's just um, many different ways, just different than, uh, than it used to be. Yeah, and you get a sense you get more time to focus on your religious and spiritual needs while staying at home. Is that the same for you? Yes, definitely. I mean, we do have the time, which we are not wasting anymore on traveling to, you know, one another place. Yeah, so you're at home and you're able to kind of interact with your family uh, members and get closer to Allah. Now, I know you were here in February previewing the Muslim Changemaker virtual event. Tell us, how did they go? Well, I have to tell you the truth, it went all very well. And um, the event itself has been uh, visited by people. We had guest speakers from uh, 
US, Canada, UK, many different European countries, the GCC, and uh, we had some speakers from India as well. So it was a great event. We had 50 speakers, uh, 50 partners from all over all over these uh, geographical regions. Uh, you know, the topics were ranging. I mean, as you're very familiar with maybe some of the people who are listening or watching now as well, from fashion, lifestyle, sports, business, um, uh, health, um, food, obviously, you know, uh, parenting, uh, a lot of interesting topics were, um, um, you know, were discussed during these sessions. Yeah, I know. I did. And it all went uh, Yeah, I'm sorry, just this... well because... I was privileged to be a part of it. I, I was kind of facilitating a couple of, uh, two or three conversations, I think. Um, really enjoyed the sort of breath. And that was the amazing thing, Marta. You had people in Canada, you had people in Dubai, you had people uh, in the UK, all together on a platform having a global conversation, demonstrating the power of the global ummah. And I think this, at the end of the day, this we have to thank to, uh, you know, being in lockdown, because otherwise we probably would not even have had such an event. Yeah. It was such a, an obvious thing to do, to bring everybody together online, because we just couldn't move, move around. And then suddenly the world becomes very small. So you can literally bring all these global communities together. And then, um, you know, the issues are very much the same for everybody. It doesn't no matter whether you're in Dubai or in um, or in or in, um, in Toronto. Yeah. And what, what did you learn about the future of virtual events? So lots of money, lots of resources spent putting together these sort of lifestyle festivals, conferences, and then we had a pandemic and people moved online. What did you learn about what, what does the future look like? I think the future looks like hybrid. People do want interaction, human interaction. And human interaction means that you just want to meet people, you want to tell stories, have a drink together, maybe have a bite together, um, try things out, uh, look at fashion shows, you know, listen listen to live events as well. I think it's more like about the experience itself when it comes to life, but I think online is here to stay. So that's why I'm saying that combination of the two will be the, you know, the way forward yeah it's, it's trying to get the balance isn't it because lots of money will be spent on travel if you would if you had to get all those people together to come to i don't know london it, it would cost a lot of money and a lot of resource um, but to have them join you virtually via their living rooms uh it's a lot more cheaper definitely and it's not only cheaper it's also suddenly you can get anybody you know literally you can get uh so the time zones, the only thing the time zones uh, have to be matched very well, this is what you have to take care of it. But you can have people from all around the globe sitting behind their laptops any time of the event. You know, yeah. so this is not something that um, I can, uh, you know, we can um, have um, uh, had otherwise. You know, so online events are uh, making it easier to get together. But we don't want to have... Um, only on online events, I think. Yeah, because you can't really replace that face-to-face -face interaction, can you? That ability to connect with people face-to-face. -face. Exactly, and I think it's not only that. Like, when you are physically committed, you know, when, you're, when you say, like, okay, I'm going to try, go to that event, so you reserve your whole day, you're going to go um, to a certain um, location, so you kind of dedicate your whole day, or you dedicate your whole day, that event 20%. So what we are doing um, with online events is obviously we can have people going, uh, you know, maybe from their kitchen to their living room, and then they spend some time at the event, whatever they want, but they can even as easily can get distracted by anything else, you know, so the, when the mobile phones ring mm. or when the families need them or something else is happening. So you have pros and contrasts for online events and offline events as well. I mean, obviously, when it comes to the costs, it's not to be compared when, you know, online events are just so much cheaper and more effective because you can get an amazing group of people together at lesser costs. Yeah. And what did you learn about yourself during this 
because yeah, I had the privilege, as I said, of working with you. Um, and a lot of work has gone into putting these uh, virtual events together. Uh, what did you learn about yourself? Well, uh, that's an interesting question because this is uh, from this angle I haven't even looked at it. Uh, I think I would rather say not, not only just about myself but about the team is that suddenly our global team became um, such a tight and well-organized team um, as if we were physically in one room, you know? So we have shown to ourselves and also to the other ones, you know, across the globe that we can be really together and we can be, uh, we can act as one. And I think that's, that's very powerful. Yeah. And, and I don't, that's the type of person that you are, uh, Marta. You kind of uh, want to talk about your team rather than yourself. So uh, we'll give you that. And, and in a sense, what does the future hold, do you think, uh, for Islamic events and the Muslim Ummah trying to come together in a more face-to-face uh, -face way once we get through this pandemic? Yeah, I think many people will think that we have seen many people um, uh, organize, starting to organize events, for events, seminars, many different kind of things. We have not seen a lifestyle event like ours, uh, but there is obviously, um, you know, there's gonna be more people doing the same. Uh, and we also want to continue. So we are also partnering with other organizations to uh, bring something uh, exciting to, uh, um, to you and to, you know, whoever is interested in Muslim lifestyle. Yeah. And we want to bring it on a way that it, that it stays very accessible. So we have done, uh, we have, you know, tested different channels. We have done on Zoom. We, we have done Instagram events as well, where we had a, a Ramadan series. You know, we have tried different approaches. And I think it's just very exciting. I mean, you have a lot of people who are um, willing to participate and they're enjoying to be, uh, you know, part of such a such a program. So suddenly you, uh, you can just bring amazing people, you know, together. Yeah, because in a sense, people, the way people kind of watch television, interact with the media has dramatically changed with, since smartphones came along. Uh, and people are able to kind of build their life away from the traditional method of a television. Yes, and I think, you know, Internet has already done quite a, you know, big job in um, you can, uh, you know, you're not watching somebody else's programming you can just uh, choose yourself what you want and how you want it and when you want it i mean i think that's again like uh, the kind of on demand uh, uh media is very much what we are you know kind of like getting getting used to so i think when it comes to online events the recordings will be available and most of the events will be successful as well when they uh, will have their materials their videos and their uh, programs available later on for people to watch it even if they have missed it maybe on that specific date, mm. they could be able to download it or they could be able to uh, just log in and watch it whenever they have the time. Yeah, because we've kind of spent the last year or so getting used to virtual school meetings, virtual work meetings, virtual funerals, virtual birthdays, virtual Christmases and Eids. Um, people are maybe used to this sort of new type of living. Do you think this will continue? Well, I think it's hundred percent. It's here to stay, hundred percent. I think there's no other way to uh, to live anymore. I think Zoom has become very uh, due to that, and there's many many online channels as well, like Zoom, who have become like uh, incredibly, uh, you know, powerful. Yeah, really powerful stuff that's going on in terms of how you. Uh, interact uh, with that. And there used to be a time, uh, Marta, where television channels just broadcast on television. Now you can watch this as many people do on social media, on Facebook and YouTube, on Instagram uh, and YouTube, uh, uh, sorry, and, uh, and, and on, on uh, LinkedIn as well. So there's so many different platforms people are taking their news uh, and broadcast from. Exactly. And I think it's also the combination of like how you are uh use all the channels that you have because you have different people, you know, they have some people like Twitter the most, some people like LinkedIn the most, and some people like Zoom the most or Instagram the most, you know? So when you kind of like uh, try to go online, 
very, very careful with, uh, you know, to whom do you cater and in which channel you're using. But you have to be careful as, I mean, as an organizer, you just have to be not even careful, but just very conscious of uh, all the different digital channels and just make sure that all these channels are. Yeah, um, okay. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, yeah. I'm just cutting you there because we're coming to uh, our I'm final good. break. I know that Martin staying with us. Join on the other side of these important messages. We're carrying the conversation with our special guest, Marta. Asalaamu Alaikum, welcome back to Questions with me, Mohammed Shafiq, exclusively here on British Muslim TV, wherever you are around the world. We hope your Ramadan is going well. Yes, the end is nearly in sight. Uh, this time like next week, uh, Ramadan might be over. And so please seek the benefits of these last 10 days. And uh, when you do uh, prayer and when you raise your hands, please pray for us and the whole team here at British Muslim TV. Now, Marta Mariam uh, Rosa is still here with us. We were talking just before the break about virtual conferences. But I think one of the bugbears, uh, Marta, that people often feel about these online accesses, sometimes there's a loss of connection. Sometimes it's the quality of um, internet connection broadband that people have and that sometimes can put people off going forward is that a view that you would share well i think you know the connection issues you always can have it doesn't matter you know which part of the world you're from um uh, whether you're from the uk the netherlands spain india or any country uh, i would say uh, we all suffer from uh, you know bad connections because yeah. uh, whether it's the tra you know too much traffic or you know it can be different or just the weather is uh, very bad and then suddenly uh, the, ne the, the the quality of the connection drops. But I think you know technology um, um, is being developed at this very moment to uh, make sure that the, when the, when everybody's online, um, the connections will be strong enough and uh, the quality of the uh, you know um, any kind of online events or online uh, meetings will be amazing. You know because I think it's. Uh, it's becoming such a norm. I think a lot of companies, I mean, we're not just talking about events, but there's a lot of companies that they're having their, you know, weekly meetings with uh, employees or their team meetings um, or their training sessions, they're having it online. So there's a lot of people, uh, you know, it's, it's a very busy highway, if you, can, uh, if you yeah. can say that. Yeah, because, would you agree, we kind of now know that it works. You know, people working from home, their productivity hasn't gone down. People joining these virtual events who potentially might, for childcare reasons, other work commitments, caring responsibilities, wouldn't get the chance to join these virtual events. And now they can. And, and that's been a good thing for them. Well, I think it just makes life easier, you know, uh, when you have um, the possibility to join an, an online event. Obviously, there is one thing, you know, one romantic thing when it comes to offline uh, events is that you have some space and time in between sessions and, and, you know, all those kind of things which you will hardly have when you go online because you can, you are just so effective with the time that you can have meetings and events and uh, everything just back to back. And then suddenly just, uh, you know, you get tired of it. And there is the digital tiredness, I think, that a lot of us uh, is experiencing as well. So I think we still have to bring the offline experience as much as possible to online. And we have to, you know, learn, um, bring in a bit of entertainment, bring in a bit of, uh, um, you know, loosening things up. Because otherwise it's just uh, very, you know, very heavy for everybody. Now, let's talk about the Nur and Zafir Lifestyle magazine. Um, tell us a bit more about that. Well, I mean, we have uh, recently launched a Lifestyle magazine. It's an online magazine where we are uh, focusing on anything uh, connected to Muslim lifestyle. It can be about parenting or about, you know, makeup tutorials or uh, tips and uh, about sports, about extraordinary mus Muslims. We are featuring a lot of people from all, all over the globe. So... I think uh, the ones who uh, are not on the spotlight, we would love to bring as many people as possible, you know, uh, to the spotlight. Yeah. Because our community is big and it's um, not represented in any kind of media around the globe. So we just want to make a difference and make a change. Uh, um, and that's why we had those sort of change makers uh, event where we brought to one event a lot of change makers from all over the globe. And the magazine itself is 
like an ongoing, um, you know, event where you would be able to tap into um, this amazing resource of uh, people, organizations around the globe. Yeah, very powerful. And, and in, a, in a sense that this magazine kind of replicates some of the fantastic work you did in February, the Changemakers uh, events. And uh, how can people access this magazine? It's, is it through the New Zafir website? Yeah, exactly. So it's neuronsofir.com. Um, and then through that, you will click, you know, below the page, you have a link to the magazine and uh, that's uh, where it is. And then uh, you make sure you, you bookmark the page and then you will go get access to it anytime you want. So um, you can sign up for, the, for a newsletter. You can, uh, you know, look around in our uh, Muslim Lifestyle Marketplace where we have actually... Um, collected already like over 150 amazing Muslim brands from all over the globe um, who are selling um, lifestyle products. Mm. So uh, take a good look when it yeah. comes to uh, eight, eight years. I'm it's, sure you're going to find something. I'm sure they can find something. Let's open the lines and take your calls uh, if you've got time. Call, call us now on 019-24-231-083. Now, uh, tell us more about the feedback. So you run these uh, Muslim Change Maker events uh, in February and March. And what's the feedback been from those who attended, for obviously virtually, uh, about what they learned from the events? Well, I think one of the biggest feedback was that people were really, really grateful and really, really interested in the topics that we have brought together grateful for the fact of um, all the very, you know, we had very famous people from very famous people to uh, literally uh, anyone, but with a special touch, you know, and a special touch would mean that they do have a certain commitment. They do have an aim in life and they wanted to share it with, uh, with a wider audience and they found them very interesting. Uh, so, you know, sometimes very touching stories, sometimes very insightful and sometimes very powerful stories were coming through. And I think people really, really appreciated that, that we had this mix. We made it very accessible. It was not like a, you know, um, a, a conference where you would only have um, so-called life-size celebrities or anything like that. It was, it was a mix of everything. And I think that's, uh, that has been proven that it, uh, it, it has worked very well. Yeah. And, and, in terms of that uh, lifestyle magazine, how difficult is it to put out that regular magazine? A lot, I'm assuming a lot of work has to go into putting it together and getting the articles and the pictures, the design, and then uh, the sort of uploads as a via PDF file. Yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, we have uh, uh, guest writers all from all over the globe, and uh, we are obviously open to. Uh, new talented guest writers, so whoever is uh, uh, watching us, then don't forget to uh, drop us an email and uh, let us know if you're interested to become our new guest writer or one of our new guest writers, because there's always people from um, uh, different regions with different kind of um, insights and with different backgrounds that we always kind of like looking for. And, um, you know, in the magazine itself, the main aim is, again, to make it very accessible because there is no uh, vogue for Muslims, or there is no, um, you know, um, women's magazine for Muslims. It's either, um, you know, most of the, even if you look online, you have uh, magazines which are more, have a religious approach, or they have more um, kind of like historical or empowerment approach, but not about the kind of like easygoing, everyday things with that Muslim touch, which obviously there is religion, there is spirituality, there is, uh, you know, more than just um, talking about makeup and all that kind of thing. Yeah, and with a global ummah, so it's great to we can use Zoom to connect with Muslims around the world, isn't it? Uh, and experience that global ummah, more so now than uh, previous generations who were restricted in, in travelling around the world. Yeah, so I think also the global, at the end of the day, what we have seen is there are so many similarities, yeah. you know. I'd be very, you know, we we always think of like uh, there are so many countries around the globe and that people live so differently. At the end of the day, everybody has this very similar struggles. Everybody has uh, a very similar, uh, you know, uh, luggage 
when it comes to uh, being a Muslim woman, whether you're in, in a Muslim majority country or, or, or not, um, you know, you have a very similar lifestyle uh, at the end of the day. Uh, and sometimes when you live in a Muslim majority country, it's, you know, some of the things are just very obvious. You can just, you know, go down the street and all the shops are ready for you. And if you don't live in a country like that, then again, it's a different thing. But it's, uh, you know, women in sports, it's the same issue everywhere. Um, it's, um, uh, you know, being a mom and um, wanting that, to do something more with your life than just being a mom, even if it's a, if it's a huge task, but starting your business, it's the same. It doesn't matter which country you live in. You have the very, very similar, uh, you know, issues you have to deal with. You have the same problems that you want to deal with. And I think it just makes it so um, human, so, um, you know, easily accessible when you hear all the stories from everybody around the globe, whether you read them or you just listen to them um, or you interact with people who have uh, stories to tell. But people, when you, I mean, simply, you want to have a healthy Ramadan, for example. Yeah. This is, this is not anymore a local thing. This is everybody globally, you know, joining this movement. You want to, uh, you know, some people go for a vegan Ramadan. Some people go for vegetarian Ramadan. Some people just simply go for, okay, let's take care of our health. Not just our spiritual, but like inner, inner and like the entire, the entire picture. Mm -hmm. let's, take, let's take it on the loop and uh, make sure that we are uh, uh, ticking the box and, um, you know, in all senses. So I think um, bringing the world together online makes makes us feel that we are just part, part of a, a huge community and we are humans and we are Muslims and we, there's a lot of things that you know connect us and that's beautiful because we do want to share that. We do indeed want to share that. We've reached the end uh, of our time together. Uh, Marta, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, great to see you, looking good as ever and uh, we wish you and your family well and have a safe feed. Thank you so much for having me and uh, I wish you the same and I hope to uh, see you soon in our next event. Inshallah, definitely. Uh, that was Marta Mariam Rosa joining us live from Spain. Now that's the end of the programme. Next week, as the moon wars begin again, yes, we're talking about why there is a difference and why that we can get one Eid here in the UK for all British Muslims. We have the former head of the Muslim Council of Britain, Sir Iqbal Sakrani, Moon sighting expert and new TV uh, moon sighting board uh, member Raja Zaid Nawaz from Birmingham. And the new Crescent Society, Samira Mia, uh, will be back at the time of uh, 4.30 on Wednesday for the final time before we move back to our normal scheduling time of 8.30. Have a great evening. Enjoy your iftari. Remember to pray for the Ummah. Thank you so much to everybody behind the scenes. Um, from me, Mohammed Shafiq and the whole team here at British Muslim TV. Thank you so much for joining us. Take care of yourself and each other. And I'll see you very, very soon. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.